the family of Fourier transforms. So we start with what is called the temporal Fourier transform. In fact, we should start with the general Fourier transform. In general, a Fourier transform is written this way. And that is rather abstract. What is the meaning of S? What is the meaning of U? And at this point, it doesn't have meaning. It is just a mathematical transformation. Now in engineering, we tend to apply it one of two ways. And I think by far the most common is the temporal Fourier transform. That is where we interpret the U variable as time and the S variable as frequency. And so now we see we're doing something to a time function and calculating some kind of frequency function out of it. And in fact, what that frequency function is, it's a map of the complex amplitudes of all of the frequencies making up the original signal. Now, in this case, the original signal is a square wave and we get some kind of sync function looking thing. So that's the temporal Fourier transform. Now what will be called the spatial Fourier transform. So we start with the general Fourier transform. Now let's interpret this variable u as position x. And let's interpret this s variable as a k, sometimes called a momentum vector. So I use this transform a lot in electromagnetics. So over on the right, we see we have, we'll have air everywhere, except there's these little plastic cylinders made of some kind of dielectric that slows down a wave. So we have a wave above this and it's coming into this array of cylinders and it slows down on the cylinder, stays fast outside the cylinder. And what we get is this perturbed wave front on the other side. Now we can extract a cross section of this. And here's where I'm showing that cross section approximately. And we can Fourier transform that. Now what we get here really is a spectrum of plane waves. I'm showing a discrete series and really we don't get a discrete series from this equation. It's a spectrum, but I'm drawing it this way, a spectrum of plane waves, all the different angles. And the spectrum gives us the complex amplitudes of all of those different plane waves. And K is really describing the, the period of each of these waves. So that's a spatial Fourier transform, mathematically the same thing as a temporal Fourier transform. It's important to understand a sign convention here. Engineers, when it comes to Fourier transforms, we tend to use the negative sign convention. So to differentiate that from the positive sign convention used by a lot of physics and science, for the engineering, I'll use a J and a minus J, minus for the negative sign convention and I for the positive sign convention. And we can compare what all these Fourier transforms and Fourier series equations look like, depending whether we're applying the negative or positive sign convention. And a lot of times people get, can get confused because sometimes they'll see a negative sign in the exponential, sometimes they won't. And it's like, what the heck is going on? And well, that's what's happening. It's where somebody has swapped sign convention on you when that happens. So uh, watch for that. The Fourier series, if we have a function that is now periodic with period tau, our Fourier series, in fact, will be a series of impulses. And so rather than write it as a continuous function, then we really could only, we only have to write the amplitudes of those impulses, which are discrete sines and cosines, or we can also write it as discrete complex exponentials. So when we write our Fourier transform as a series of sines and cosines or complex exponentials, we call that a Fourier series. Next, we have what's called the discrete time Fourier transform. So we have a signal now, but it is sampled. So we only know the function at discrete points. If we Fourier transform a sampled function, we get the discrete time Fourier transform. And the discrete time Fourier transform is a continuous function, even though the original function is sampled. Alternatively, we can think of the discrete time Fourier transform as a Fourier series of our frequency domain or Fourier domain signal. 
Now the discrete Fourier transform or DFT. Suppose we have a function and we sample it. So we'll write that as F of N and we have N samples. If we calculate the discrete time Fourier transform, it turns out we can extract N points from that. That's our number of samples in the original function. And that completely and uniquely defines our Fourier transform. That set of N points is called the discrete Fourier transform. This is huge. And so here's typically the notation that folks would use for the DFT. Let's just compare some of these things. So we start with a square wave function and we can Fourier transform that and we get this sync function looking thing. Well, the discrete version of the square wave might look something like this. So we have discrete samples of zeros, discrete samples of ones, then back down to discrete samples of zeros. The discrete time Fourier transform is a continuous function, but it's frequency limited. We won't know outside of this. That's because it's sampled and that sets a limit to these higher frequencies that we can resolve. We'll get into that in another lecture. Uh, that goes back to the Nyquist sampling theorem. Then the discrete Fourier transform is really the n discrete points that uniquely define the discrete time Fourier transform. And so we would draw it this way. So this is again, a discrete function, but discrete time Fourier transform is a continuous function.